my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope and no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given in. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free Washes over me You have made me new Now life begins with you It's your I'm a prisoner no more. If she was a ransom, faithfully more. He canceled my debt. I often do 
every song I sing and you never come on church we sing so I throw my hands
There's no one that's like you. There's no one that's worthy of our praise the way that you are. There's no person, there's no thing that stands beside you that can compare to your greatness. God, we thank you for the love that you've demonstrated for us through Christ Jesus. That we are no longer bound by sin and shame. We can sing these songs of freedom in this place today because of the work that you have done for us through Jesus. God, thank you. You and you alone are great. You and you alone are worthy of our full attention, our full affection today. So God, meet us here in this place. God, reveal to us the places where we're broken in ways that we're holding back from you. God, heal. Heal what's sick. God, we put our trust in you, and we know that you can. We love you, and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, can we give God some praise this morning? Yeah, come on. Amen. Hey, before you sit down, if you had any empty seats in your row, would you please do us a favor and scoot in and fill in those seats that are in the middle of your row to free up the seats that are along the aisle? You've heard us say that before. We really need your help today. We've got folks still waiting to get in in the lobby, so we would appreciate your help. And then you may be seated. We are super glad that you're here, whether this is your first time or you've been here a number of times. We enjoy getting together with you each week. I love this place. We want to invite you to be a part of what God is doing here. My name is Don Ellsworth. I'm the missions pastor here at Austin Ridge and counted a privilege to be able to serve alongside of you in our city and around the world. We want you to know that we want you to be in a relationship with Jesus. And so that is the most, uh, that the best connection that we can help you make. Uh, we want to invite you to uh, stop at one of our connections desk on the way out today, or you can scan the QR code that is between any of your seats here in the worship center That'll get you connected to a uh, digital connect card. We would love to get you connected in community, find serve opportunities. Uh, we would love to be able to help in whatever way we can do that. You've heard us talk over the last couple of weeks about the Ridge Guide. This is a great resource. If you haven't picked one up yet, I want to encourage you to pick one up before you leave today. This is basically one-stop shopping to be able to find out the events, the classes, the serve opportunities that are going on here at the Ridge over the next few months. If you haven't picked one up, stop and get one on your way out. Take a look at it, and we would love, again, to help you get connected to serve in whatever way possible. One of the things that's highlighted in here are serve opportunities. We believe that as Christ followers, Jesus has called us to make a spiritual difference in the life of other people once we have been blessed with that. And so we want to encourage you to take a look at serve opportunities that are happening here on campus, both on Sundays and throughout the week, but also in the one that's near and dear to my heart are the ways that you can get involved here in our city and around the world again, to make a spiritual difference in the lives of those that still need Jesus. And this is cool. Um, remember Christmas Eve? wasn't that long ago. Uh, it was a beautiful night. We had the candles going. It's a kind of a fun evening. Well, we have the opportunity to repurpose those thousands of candles that we used here on our campuses on Christmas Eve to send to a connection in the Ukraine. We have a connection with a church. It's actually the home church of some of our Ridge Partners, uh, Ukrainian Ridge Partners that are here as a part of our congregation and their home church. 
Uh, we'll be sending them those candles to them. Uh, we're praying for Ukraine. The war that's going on is horrific. But with the war going on, power goes out frequently. Candles are scarce, and they're super expensive. When the power goes out, we now will have a number, hundreds and thousands of candles that will be going to that church there, not only for their personal use, but also as an evangelistic outreach uh, in that region as well. So we just wanted to share that story with you. That's kind of cool. That doesn't happen every day. <laughs> We're glad that you're here today. We're going to continue to worship as we open up into the book of Acts. Thanks for being here this morning. Westlake Bible Church, now Austin Ridge Bible Church. The first Sunday was about 75 people. We rely on God's word, God's truth, and it's not something new, but it's paramount. You know, there's a verse about God but going before us and being our rear guard. And he's just gone before us every step of the way. And we have to be obedient to what God wants for our church. People were willing to be real. And that was the message was, are you willing to be real? Are you willing to be honest? I feel like that really set the stage for it is all about Jesus and staying true to his word. To walk with God throughout the entire day and to be more drawn to him so that what we do, we get to do out of freedom and joy because of who we are in him. What you see now is a steadfast commitment to the word of God, a commitment to being dependent on the spirit of God on daily living, and a commitment to honoring the intention that Christ had from the very beginning of the local church. It's not about Austin Ridge, it is about the kingdom of Christ. How we doing church? I want to say good morning to Dripping Springs and Southwest Campus. We're going to be in Acts 4. If you want to go ahead and go there, we're going to cover the first 12 verses this morning. Before we, or as you're going there, I want to talk to the men for a minute. Last week, we we're going to have Warrior Night. Weather was bad. We wanted to take care of y'all. We didn't want you to be too cold. So we're doing Warrior Night this Tuesday night. I need all the men in this room to be at Warrior Night Tuesday night. All the men at Southwest Dripping Springs Campus, I want you to come to Warrior Night. I've got a, a talk I'm putting together. My wife asked me, is, is this a talk for men in today? I said, no, it's a talk for men at all times. Like this is, this is going to be a good night for us. We got pork barbecue sandwiches, which is the way God intended barbecue to be eaten. <laughs> you need to go to austinridge.org slash warrior night and sign up. We need to know you're coming so we can prepare food for you. It's going to be great food. We got the best cooks in the world making this food for you. Be there Tuesday night. Wives, remind your husbands. If you're not married, remind a guy. Tell him to come. All right. People keep asking me, like, how you doing with the recovery? And some of you don't know, I had a couple of strokes back in um, July. So I'm, I'm six months in, went to get a brain scan two weeks ago. And I saw the doctor this week, went through the brain scan. He said, see that dark spot on your brain scan? He said, that's a hole in your brain. I'm like, great. <laughs> I asked him, I said, is humor in that hole or is it outside that hole? Because that <laughs> matters to me. So there's a hole in my brain. So I know that for me, I'm not normal yet. He said it's going to be one to two years to see what the new norm is. I can tell when I preach it's not normal. I can tell it's not the way I'm used to preaching. It's not as sharp. Uh, some of you have told me very graciously, you sound normal to me. I appreciate that. I'm not. I know that inside of me I struggle at times. Um, I'm, I'm usually two sentences ahead of what I'm saying when I preach. Now I'm in the sentence. Okay. So I have these little pauses. It's a stroke. Okay. Get over it. You can... <laughs> if you wait for me a second, I'll be back with you. All right. <laughs> But I just want you to know, just update the recovery. I'm, I'm, I'm working hard at it, and um, I'm just glad to be here, honestly, after six months. All right. As we go through the text this morning, it's not just true historically what we're going to see in this text, but what you're going to see in the text is also true prophetically, meaning this. It's not just true at this moment in time in Acts 4. It is true at every moment of every time for every Christian in every church person of all time. This text is huge. It's the first log on the fire of what happens to the church and the Christian for the rest of all time. So we saw in chapter three, lame man born that way, taking to the temple every day, placed at the gate, asking for money. Peter and John come, says, we don't have silver and gold to give you. What we do have to give you, arise and walk in the name of Jesus by the authority of Jesus Christ. We see this miracle happen. And then he starts jumping up and down, leaping, going to the temple, what would you think after that happened? What do you think would happen next after that? Like you never want to mess a good church service up with a great miracle, right? 
You would think, I would think after that happened in a church service, that tons of people would just go nuts and be converted to Christ. and It would be the greatest church service you've ever been in. Well, what the guys are going to do, they're religious guys at this temple, they're not going to rejoice. They're going to call security. All right? So I'm going I'm to take the first half of my sermon to describe the first four verses to you contextually because you need to understand why what's happening is happening and why it's such a big deal in the context of Acts chapter 4. Acts 1. And as they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Speaking of humor, I just realized I had the same shirt on I had in that slide for Warrior Night. I understand that, okay? <laughs> Before I can go on, I just need to clarify that. I will, not, I will not wear this shirt Thursday night or Tuesday night. Okay, we're good. Let me read that again. I'm sorry. And, I, and as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Why is this such a big deal? The captain of the temple, think of him as like the head of security over the temple. I realize we have security officers here at the ridge. Sometimes I get asked, why do you have security officers at the ridge? Have you gotten death threats? Well, no, but it's not just to protect me. We have security here at the ridge because the world has fallen. We live in a fallen world. And we have security here, there is, not just for me, to protect you as well. We have a lot of children on these campuses. We have a lot of people that we take care of. So they are here to help protect and make sure everything goes smoothly as well. So the captain of the temple was kind of the head of security. He would have 150 soldiers under his deployment at the temple that stayed there during any services that were going on. And these men were not just protecting the treasuries of the temple, but they were also given charge of watch. Remember I said, if you were a, a Gentile man, you could not go past the, the wall where the Gentile women were or where the Gentile, uh, the Jewish women or the Jewish women were. If you were to cross that barrier, those security officers had given approval by Rome to literally kill you if you cross that barrier. We don't have any barriers like that on this campus, just so you know, so you don't have to worry about that. So these men were there and this captain of the temple was in charge. And then it says the Sadducees. The Sadducees are the ones that call security on Peter and John in this situation. And I'm going to spend the next few minutes telling you why they had to shut this down. So in Israel, you have what is called a priestly line. Back from Exodus, Aaron with Moses. He was the priest when Moses went up on, on, the, on the mount to get the Ten Commandments, came back, and they're having a party around the fire. And Aaron's the one who said, I don't know what happened. We threw this gold in. This golden calf popped out. And we just started having a party, and I couldn't stop the, the crowds. Not a great prophet, or not a great priest at that moment. So Aaron, if you trace Aaron, the ironic priest line, all the way to 1 Samuel. Right before the book of 1 Samuel, you had the book of Judges. Judges were men and women who were set up by God in places of authority to either lead in a certain way or militaristically to protect Israel as a nation. Okay? So right after the Judges, you have Samuel. Samuel technically is the last judge in your Bible, but he's also the first priest in your Bible that we're going to see as also a prophet. Now, a priest is someone who stands between the people and between God. A priest takes the sacrifices and, and takes the sacrifice on the altar, and so the sins of the people are forgiven. They stand between the wrath of God, technically, and the justice of God and the people's sin. Does that make sense? A prophet is someone who says, thus saith the Lord. Samuel is a prophet, although he's going to be raised to be a priest at the same time. So he actually serves both roles of both prophet, thus saith the Lord, and priest, I stand between God and the people. Next, you're going to have another person named Saul who's a king. A king is someone who stands over the people and represents the people to God. And that's why it's important throughout your Bible, you see, as the king goes, so go the people. Also in our nation, as the leaders go, sometimes so go the, the people in the nation as well. But in your Bible, you never have anywhere you have a priest, prophet, and king. You never have one person serving all three offices until you get to Jesus Christ himself. Now, David was a prophet at times and a priest, and he was also a king at times. But then David also had some sin in his life that discounted him from those three offices eventually by the end of his life. So Jesus Christ is the perfect priest, prophet, and king. So when you get to the end of your Old Testament, Malachi, beginning of your, first, of your New Testament is Matthew. Between Malachi and Matthew, you have 400 years. We call them the silent years theologically. It's where God did not send a prophet for 400 years. No one said, thus saith the Lord for 400 years. It's as if God 
just says, I'm not talking anymore to you guys get tracked together. And then when Matthew opens up, you have John the Baptist. Behold, Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. For the first time ever, he baptizes Jesus, and then he raises him up. And for the first time in 400 years, you hear the voice of God. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. That was the first voice of God the nation had heard in over 400 years. Between those Malachi and Matthew, those 400 years, you had these certain groups of people rise up to fill the void of not hearing from the Lord. Is it, ever a good oppor- is it ever a good thing for people to speak when you don't hear from the Lord and rise up in that void? Usually not. So you have these people called Pharisees. You have these people called Sadducees. You've heard me use these words before. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Sadducees today. But let's start with Pharisees. Pharisees were people who, like most religious people, Pharisees love law and they love rules and they love protocols. You ever remember going through school, you have the, the curb buster? No one likes the curb buster. You don't like that guy, you don't like that girl. You don't want the goody tushies to come to your party on Friday night. Why? Because the goody tushies will come and they'll tell your parents what you did on Friday night. So you, no one likes those people. No one likes the people who keep all the rules. With well, a Pharisee's job, they saw themselves as a watchdog of, of Israel to make sure they kept all the rules. The problem with religious people is this. They get to determine what the rules are. And they get to determine whether you're keeping the rules the way they want you to keep those rules or not. Is it possible that religion is still used this way to control people? Absolutely. So you have the Pharisees. The Pharisees also were one group. And, and they, they felt that the Jews, as they were in exile in Babylon, as they were in exile in Persia, as they were in exile under the Greeks, as they were under the Roman authorities, they believed the outside Gentile world had brought too much into their lives. So it was their job to clean everybody's behavior up. Most of you, if you grew up in church like I did, a lot of us thought Christianity was behavioral modification. We, we wouldn't say it then. But what we thought was being a Christian means you're a good little boy and you're a good little girl. You don't do these things, you do these things. And as long as you do these things and don't do those things, and as long as you behave well, then God's happy with you. But once you get to, to a walk with Christ, your relationship with Christ, you start to realize it's not about me being behaved well. It's about me having a heart that yearns for God. It's about my love for the Lord. I do the things I do, not so be happy with me. I do the things I do because he loves me. I do the things he, does, he, he wants me to do because of his grace and his mercy. So these Pharisees, Jesus always had conflict with the Pharisees because they were always trying to say things about him. So the Pharisees, what they decided to do is we're going to take over the synagogue. Synagogue is an organization that happened between Malachi and Matthew, those 400 years. Every little village, every little town, we would call it a church or a chapel, something like that. They didn't call it church, obviously. It was a synagogue. And so they ran the synagogues. They were the ones who were the watchdogs over the common people in the synagogues. Now, there was another group of people that rose up. By the way, the Pharisees also made a lot of money in the synagogues because you had to buy sacrifices. You follow me? They also learned how to control the people because the synagogue became the place of education for the Jewish boys and the Jewish girls. So they controlled the education system as well. Now you have a group called the Sadducees. The Sadducees are not like the Pharisees. They don't want to deal with the common people. The Sadducees are people who are aristocratic, who are wealthy, and they love power. They did not want to deal with the common people in the synagogues. What they wanted is, we want the oval office. We want the temple. The temple that's controlled and run by Rome. We want to be in bed with Rome, if you will, and we want to make sure we have their backing so we have the authority over the temple. That if, if the synagogues made good money, the temple was an ATM machine. You follow me? So the Sadducees started to run the temple, and they saw it as a money-making power that they could gain power. So they were always wanting to appease Rome because they really didn't care about what God thought. They cared what Rome thought because that was where their wallet was filled. Now, Sadducees were also people who did not believe in angels, did not believe in demons, did not believe in the afterlife, did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. That is why they're called sad, you see because they don't believe in the resurrection. You follow me? (laughs) Old pastor joke. They felt there was no such thing as an angelic realm. So literally, if you don't think there's an angelic realm and you don't think there's afterlife, what are you going to focus on in this life? Money and power. He who has the most toys when he dies wins, right? No, you just die. That's, That's the biblical aspect of that. The Pharisees, the Sadducees were constantly pushing each other back and forth on who would gain power. It was really the first political system that we see with Republicans and Democrats. I'm not going to tell you who's who, who's the Sadducee and Pharisee. I'm not going to tell you that. The Sadducees end up winning this battle with the Pharisees, and they're in charge of the temple, and they literally have a ton of money that's happening. Now, 
Remember a guy named Caiaphas during the time of Jesus and his trials? The guy named Caiaphas. Caiaphas heard about Lazarus being raised from the dead. Caiaphas said, and I don't think he knew he was speaking prophecy, but he was speaking prophecy. Caiaphas said, it would be better for one man to die than for the whole nation to die. Here's what Caiaphas was saying. If this Lazarus guy keeps going around saying, I was dead for three days and now I'm good. And Jesus said, come forth and I walked out of the grave. If this, if this Lazarus guy continues to do this, Rome is going to see it as an insurrection against their power. And Rome is going to come in and want to control the temple and take the money away from us. Does that make sense? So Caiaphas, a Sadducee, said, we've got to kill Lazarus again and make sure he stays dead. And so Caiaphas was a Sadducee. And Caiaphas also said, if this man continues to talk, the whole nation will die. But they weren't saying we would all die physically, although Rome may do that. What they're saying is, we, the Sadducees, will lose all of our power. We'll lose all of our leverage. We'll lose everything we have to do. So again, they didn't care about what God thought. All they cared about was their money. So again, this is Peter and John saying, by the power and authority of Jesus Christ, get up and walk, you're healed. And this guy dancing around the temple. This is David versus Goliath again. All right? So Peter and John is David in the story, and you got Goliath. You, you basically got the whole Roman Empire that they've got to take a stand against in the context of this story. Are you following me? Yes. That was a lot of stuff, right? Look at verse 3. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. The reason they put them in custody the next day was because it was illegal to have a trial at night. And you had to wait till the morning. Although two months earlier in the same building with these same men, they had no problem doing an illegal trial with Jesus all through the night. But many of those who had heard the word believed and the number of the men came to about 5,000. That's one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. It takes such pressure off me as a pastor. I can't mess this up. Now I can do something stupid and mess up my testimony but I can't mess up the power of the gospel message. I just need to tell what the Bible says. That's why when pastors try to get cute and just try to think about all their opinions, just teach the Bible. Just teach the Bible word by word, verse by verse, book by book, and God does what he does. This is what the word does because the gospel cannot be stopped. So they arrest these two men. Now imagine Peter and John are sitting in prison that night thinking this is a little deja vu. Two months earlier, Jesus is in the same prison by the same guards, for the same charge of what authority do you do, you do this by, awaiting the trial in the night. They're thinking, we have now taken the place of Jesus as we sit in this prison floor. What's also interesting, too, is I was reading about this corporate general said this, and I heard him in a talk, and I went and did some research on it. I think he's right. He said, historically speaking, if an insurrection or rebellion or a, a pushback happens well in culture, it's always been by at least 5,000 men. I thought, that's interesting. So sure enough, I went back and studied some insurrections, some revolts, and it always had at least 5,000 men. Peter and John, follow me here. Peter and John go to bed. The church is 3,120 people. They wake up as 8,120 people. 5,000 men get converted while these men get their eight hours of sleep. What's amazing is the Sadducees are going, there's 5,000 new Christians. Now, the word Christian literally means little Christ. It doesn't mean you have like a Napoleon complex. You're walking around saying, I'm God in the flesh. Little Christ means I'm a follower of Christ. When you look at me, you see Jesus. That's what a Christian is. Watch me. Watch what I do. So now they wake up and they got 5,000 little Jesuses running around. And you got this man still leaping in the temple because he's still excited about being healed. And he hasn't even gone home yet. And now you got Peter and John who just spent the night in the jail and they've been accused by what authority? And you're going to see that as I unfold the rest of this text. Look at verse 5. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem. When Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John and Alexander, all Sadducees, and all who were of the high priestly family, and when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power, by what name did you do this? The greatest revivals in America right now in this country are happening in prisons. Statistically speaking, the greatest revivals in America right now are happening in prisons. We have a lot of our volunteers hit the ribs. We do a lot of prison ministry. We go, we speak, we love, we listen, we counsel, we, we teach the Bible, we have Bible studies. I've, I've spoken at some of the area prisons where you literally, as I'm teaching, I got so convicted 
of thinking you in these walls behind these bars have so much more freedom than so many people out there who claim to know Jesus and they are completely slaves to everything else. You guys are the ones that have the freedom behind these bars. Matter of fact, if you look at the last 19 centuries of the world's history, there have been more Christians arrested for their faith than all the other centuries, the 19th centuries leading up, I'm sorry, the 20th century, more people arrested in the 20th century than all 19th centuries combined worldwide. Coincidentally, I don't think God's putting people in prison just because the bad is winning. I believe he's allowing people to go to prison because that's where revival is happening. One pastor said like this, if you throw a man on his back, all he can do is look up and see God. <laughs> I thought, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty true. So these two men, they thought, well, we'll just shut them up. We'll arrest them. And you're going to see all through Acts. Well, now we'll just beat them. We'll beat them. They'll shut up. Now we'll threaten to kill them. They'll shut up. Now we'll try to stone them. They'll shut up. You can't stop the gospel, folks. Peter and John have now traded places with Jesus. Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. If they call the head of the household Beelzebub, how much more are the members of his house? They hated me, they'll hate you too. The disciple is not greater than his teacher. And so here we are. The first time in your Bible, you see Christians being arrested for speaking truth about the gospel message. Does 5,000 sound familiar to you biblically? 5,000 people were what? Fed. Jesus just did the same miracle again, fed 5,000, fed them spiritually. What he can do physically, he can also do spiritually. No detail is wasted ever in your Bible for what's happening in the text. Peter and John go to sleep. Man can't stop the gospel. Question, did Peter plan on all of this happening when he went to the temple that day? You think this lame guy was kind of, we'll put the lame guy there and we got this thing we'll do, a little trick, and you get up and walk and you're feeling good enough to do that today, right? No. Peter, all Peter was doing is all you and I have to do. He was being faithful where he's planted. Peter was praying, reading his Bible, taking opportunities when the gospel opportunity came to speak and open his mouth. He was having meals with, with brothers and sisters in Christ. He was going to the temple where the saints gather. He was just going and being faithful every place that God put him to do it. Making sure that our actions should validate the words we're going to use, though, is the trick, isn't it? You ever heard someone say that you're writing checks, your body can't cash? I think a lot of times people hear Christians talk about their faith and they're like, why should I care what you say about your faith? You're as bitter as I am. You won't forgive just like I have a problem for not forgiving someone. Your relationships are just as jacked up as mine are. You talk about our boss just the way I talk about my boss. You do the same things on the weekends that I do on the weekends. And I think the world wants to see actions before they hear words, and they hate hearing words without seeing actions. Does that make sense? We call it a hypocrite. Number one reason when you talk to people, why don't you go to church anymore? Well, too many hypocrites. Church full of hypocrites. As I always say, great, come on, we got room for one more. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, we are all hypocrites. I judge other people by a level and expectation that I myself don't even meet in my own life at times. Hypocrite. I will look at people and judge them for something, and I'll go do the same thing that doesn't bother me, but bothers me when they do it. Hypocrite. We're all hypocrites to some point. What's amazing about this is the Sadducees do not ask them, can you defend the teaching of what you gave in your sermon? Can you show us in the Bible why you're teaching what you're teaching? No. What's the question they ask? By what authority do you do this? You see, religious, legalistic people always talk about authority. I always talk about protocols and procedures and rules because that's the control mechanism to control people. So what they want to know is, by what authority do you do this? Now, if I'm Peter, I might well just point to the guy jumping up and down. <laughs> that's the authority. Like, I don't know. This guy was lame. Now he's not. Can you imagine them being upset because a lame man is now jumping up and down the temple? Yes. When it's not about God, it's about money, it's about power, it's about influence, it's about all the things that the Sadducees loved. By Mosaic law, the Mosaic law specified that if a person were to teach after a healing and the teaching led people away from God or does not align with the scriptures, then the Jewish people had every right at that moment to stone them to death. So they've now seen this healing and they have saying, not by our authority, but by authority of Jesus Christ, whom you crucified. 
whom you rejected, whom you killed. Now, if you're the Sadducees, you're a little bothered by this because Rome is the one who keeps you in power. And Rome believes that all hail Caesar, the one and only true king. Caesar is the one that is the king. Now you got two guys healing this guy. He's leaving him down the temple and they're going, no, we have a higher authority than someone even in Rome who says they're king. So Jesus, remember this? Jesus goes in the temple, turns the tables over. By what authority do you cleanse the temple? And Jesus said, my father's house is meant to be a light for all the nations and you guys have made it a den of robbers. Jesus was not just talking about turning the tables over. He was talking about the Sadducees, these religious people who was just doing this for money and did not care at all about what God thought. Keep in mind, Peter and John had healed a man from birth, an undeniable miracle witnessed by hundreds of people. And they asked, by what a power and authority? Did they ever do this to Jesus, the same thing? He's on the Sabbath one day. A man has a shriveled hand. Jesus touched his hand and it was healed on the Sabbath. And these religious guys are upset. You can't do that kind of stuff on the Sabbath. I would say, what better day to do this than the Sabbath? We're in church. If someone gets healed right now, great. What better time to do that than that? Now, people will come to me and they'll say, well, why don't you see those healings? Why don't you see those miracles? We see them all the time. I should not be here. The doctors have told me, no, don't clap on that. The doctors have told me I should be dead. The fact that you're still alive, not, you didn't have to have a stroke. The fact that you're still alive is a miracle. You know what you've done. You know where you've been. You should not be alive. Can we all agree with that? We grew up, I grew up, if you're, I'm 54, I grew up riding three-wheelers. We should all be dead. If, <laughs> if you're over the age of 45, you should all be dead and you ever rode a three-wheeler. You should be dead. My dad took the governor off my moped that went 23 miles an hour legally and it would go 45 miles an hour. I should be dead, right? We see these miracles all the time. Now, whenever someone says that, I say, well, have you tried to heal a lame person lately? Because we see people being healed here at Austin Ridge all the time as we pray. Now, sometimes God heals people. Sometimes he doesn't heal people. Either way, he's going to heal them. It may not be now. It's going to be later. It's going to be on that other side of the grave instead of this side of the grave. We talked about that a few weeks ago. All right. Now, Jesus also said, in the day that you get called to account, do not worry, but the spirit of my father will lead you into what to say. Aren't you glad for that? Because Peter's saying, I'm about to open my yapper. <laughs> you better tell me what to say. Now, before I go into what Peter said, I want to say this. You and I, everybody in this room, everyone in this room that's a Christian has the same spirit of God living inside of them as Peter had in him. Every Christmas room has the same spirit living inside that they had in John the Apostle. Every person in this room. Now, we can quench the spirit, the Bible says. We can grieve the spirit. When we do our things our ways, we grieve the spirit. I've used the illustration before. It's like we were growing up. You didn't have bottled water. You had the hose, right? <laughs> you drink water out of the hose. You need to cut the hose off. You don't want to walk over and do the hose. You, you, you quench it in your hand. You hold it. Cuts the, that's what we do with the spirit of God. Sin does that. Sin quenches him. Not spending time with the word, quench the spirit, not praying, quench the spirit, not talking to him, quench the spirit, not submitting to him, not dealing with something we put on our conscience, quench the spirit. And so the same spirit lives inside of us as Peter, as John. That's why Jesus said, when I leave, you'll see even greater miracles than you witness with me. What was, Peter what was Jesus talking about? Peter never, hang never walked on water. So why was Jesus saying the miracles you'll see are even greater? The miracle of salvation is the greatest miracle in the Bible. This man could go to bed in a prison cell and 5,000 people go from life to death. Jesus never saw that in his ministry. He never went to bed one night and woke up 5,000 people were Christians after that. That's what we get to be a part of, guys, as the church. Now, I don't know if you recognize this or not. I said this several weeks ago. In the United States of America, Christians were always the home team. We're not the home team anymore, guys. We're the visiting team. It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. The Bible promises this both prophetically and also scripturally. People aren't going to like you just because you're a Christian. Just because you're a Christian. Hey, don't invite that person to party because they won't be comfortable with what we want to do tonight. When you take a light and you put it in a dark place, the darkness does not like that light. It wants the light to go away because it exposes the darkness. It changes the darkness. Some of you are thinking, well, People don't like me because I'm a Christian, and yet I've never even said anything to them. You don't have to. I've never done anything. You don't have to. 
It's just because your presence is a conviction. They will, they will start saying, oh, here comes Mr. Perfect Christian, always judging everybody else. I didn't even say anything. Your presence judges. Your very presence validates a truth that they're not willing to surrender to in your very life. Does that make sense? All right, let's go to verse eight. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God called or raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. Peter is pointing his finger at this point in his sermon. This guy's jumping up and down because the authority is Jesus Christ, whom you killed, whom you crucified, whom you rejected. Now, when I think about Peter, pre-Acts 2, Peter was a numbskull, right? Like Peter would say things and do things. Have I said this this, this hour about Peter? Okay, Peter, <laughs> mouth insert foot. I can, I can relate to Peter all the time. Jesus tells Peter, I must go to the cross. I must die. This is the by over my dead body. The guy comes to take him away, pulls the sword out, cut off Michael's ear in the garden. Peter always acted and thought later after he was remorseful afterwards. What happened from Peter to this guy who's standing in the very place that Jesus was accused of a crime that would lead to the cross, the same people two months later, the Spirit of God, the same Spirit of God that lives in you. You ever hear someone say, well, if someone asks me about my faith, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say, so I don't say anything. That's never a good answer. If you know one thing to say, well, say one thing. If all you know to say is, all I know is I used to not know Jesus, and now I have a relationship with him, and my life has changed. Say that. If all you know to say is, what I can tell you is God is a loving God, and he forgives, and he wants that relationship with you. Say that. The fact that we say we don't know how to answer the question, we always think someone's going to come with some weird off-the-wall question, and they might, because that's, that's cop-out questions, trying to get the topic off the topic. If someone comes with a question you can't answer, say, you know what? I say this all the time. That's a great question. I have no idea. But it has nothing to do with Jesus. Well, let's get back to the topic of what we're talking about. So Peter, this bold stud, is now pointing his finger, preaching to these religious people unabashedly, unashamed. Look at verse 11. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders which has become the cornerstone. Now what Peter's referring to is an Old Testament, Psalm 118, verse 22 and 23. Let me read this to you. Psalm 118, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is, a, it is marvelous in your eyes. Contextually in Psalm 118, is talking about David. King David, was king after a man after God's own heart. I'm actually going to talk about him on Tuesday night. King David came to the temple, but his people had rejected him at that point. And then David wrote Psalm 118. There is a stone coming. You can reject me. There's a stone coming who will be the cornerstone, and it will be a marvelous thing. And it's interesting, then Jesus comes along, and Peter's saying, you rejected the stone. You're the builders. He's saying, you the religious people, you're supposed to protect the people. You're supposed to teach the truth. You're supposed to live the truth. Your whole life is given to what the Bible has to say, and you have not done it. You think that's possible with pastors today? Sometimes people say, you know, I'd love to be a pastor. I get that every once in a while. I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> the Bible talks about in the New Testament, at judgment day, there's a stricter judgment on me. It's going to be on you. I don't like that verse. I've never put that verse in a frame. It's nowhere in my house. <laughs> Do you want to stand in my line? Probably not. But, you know, I still don't worry about that because I'll tell you why. As long as I just do what God tells me to do, I don't have to worry about anything else. As long as I preach what God tells me to preach, I don't have to worry about anything else. That's why we no longer fear men, Paul says. If we did, we would no longer be bondservants to Christ Jesus. We would be bondservants to people instead. And the thing about people, here's what I learned about people. You can't ever please them. There's always something else that's wrong. 
Peter said this, on this rock, or, uh, Jesus asked Peter, the people are saying this, the people are saying this, Peter, who are you say? I say you're the son of the living God. Jesus says, on that rock, on that truth, that Peter, that you just said, that's the statement, that's the confession, I'm going to build my church. And what Peter is also saying here is, not only did you guys reject the stone, but the church is the rock, the cornerstone is Jesus, that he's building his New Testament church now, and you guys are missing it. And that jumping up and down pogo stick guy, he understands more than you do, the religious leaders of the entire nation. God the Father has raised this Jesus to become the cornerstone of a brand new building. That building is the church. Is the church perfect? I wouldn't ask this question ever, but I'd say, how many of you, don't do it, how many of you raise your hands if you've ever been hurt by church? There'll be a ton of hands this room go up. We hear it all the time in our membership process, well, I have church hurt. That's the phrase used, I have church hurt, I have church hurt. Can I just explain something to you? You don't have church hurt, you have people hurt. The bride of Christ is perfect. People mess the bride of Christ up. People taint the work of the church. People get on their own agendas. People get off target. People start to preach opinions instead of truth from the word of God. We have people hurt. And we're going to have people hurt until Jesus comes back. Praise the Lord that one day there'll be no more people that hurt us, right? All right, let's see the end at verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else. I'm going to say that again. There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Is that opinion or is that biblical fact? Biblical fact. Now, a lot of people say, what about the five pillars of Islam? There is one name, there is one path to the Lord. It's not the five pillars of Islam. What about the eightfold path of Buddhism? What about the meditations of Hinduism? What about the good works of Jehovah's Witness and reading the Watchtower? What about the good works of Mormonism? What about the ism-asm, any other ism-asm spasm you want to put into the category? This is where we will get hated in our world. There is one way to heaven. His name is Jesus Christ. The one name by which heaven has proclaimed all must be saved. Pastor, that's exclusive. It is exclusive. Pastor, that's inclusive. It is inclusive. Pastor, that's not tolerant. It's not tolerant. Truth never is any of those things. Truth always is exclusive. Truth always is inclusive. Truth always is, not, is, is intolerant. And once you start trying to make it tolerant and inclusive and exclusive, you're not going to be dealing with truth anymore. Now you're dealing with truth that man has added something to. Now you've got religion and not Christianity. You follow me? So when people say to me, are you religious? I'm not religious. I, I can't stand religion. I would rather be on the golf course or the lake on Sundays if it's up to me. If this is not the, the word of God and Jesus is not who he said he is, why am I going to come hear someone like me talk for 40 minutes? Why would I want to do that? This is, this is weird. It's weird that y'all come and talk. And it's not a dialogue. It's a monologue. It's, it's just odd, isn't it? But there is something supernatural that's happened to us, hasn't it? There is something that has changed us from the inside out. There's someone that has changed us from the inside out. And it's by his authority that we do what we do. By his authority, we live. Jesus is the only way of salvation. The Bible is clear. What happens to the lame man also needs to happen to you and I. We need to get up and we need to walk. We need to quit blaming others. We need to quit being the victim. We need to quit blaming our upbringing. We need to quit blaming our parents. We need to quit blaming friends. We need to get up and walk because the Spirit of God lives inside of us. What's going to happen to Peter? You got to come back next week. <laughs> but what happens to Peter is going to happen to us as well, and it always happens to Christians who follow the Lord. When you say there is one way, walk in it, people are going to hate you. I'm more fearful, though, of not saying it than fearful of repercussions saying it. Pastor, why do you think you're the only one that knows the truth and everybody else is wrong? I don't think I'm the only one that knows the truth and everybody else is wrong. I just know the truth. And you can put any words around that you want to put, but Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, if he walks on water, you might want to take notes and follow him. That's pretty amazing. If he heals the, a, a dead man to, to walk, you may want to follow him. If he walks on water, if he heals a leper, you may want to follow him. If he doesn't, he's just another religious lunatic. 
but we have over 35 verified geographically historical eyewitness accounts of miracles of Christ. The miracles were not to be a trick for people to believe in Jesus. The miracles are done to confirm so Jesus could preach and what he preached. Same thing for us. The way we live is validated. What we say is validated by how we live. So here's my prayer for us this week. We live better this week than we did last week. I talked to my daughter, Lydia, this past week. She's in the, her first tax season, accounting, year one student. I said, Lydia, what are, your, what are your hours starting January 2nd? 9 to 11 p.m. Monday through Friday. 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. Monday through Friday. <laughs> Eight hours on Saturday, two hours on Sunday. I am so happy for Lydia. I'm glad they're working her to the bone. Work that girl. She got a free ride for 23 years. You need to work her. <laughs> so Lydia and I were talking about this. She said, Dad, she had been to company just, I think, two weeks. She was having lunch with, they call year one, her year ones, because that's where you start life, right? Year one, level one, level one, that's it. So with the level ones having lunch, she said, Dad, I couldn't believe how bad they were talking about our bosses. They were just ripping our bosses. She said, Dad, it just bothered me. Why would they do that? Like, I said, Lydia, your bosses have forgotten more accounting than you ever learned at McCombs Business School at the University of Texas. He said, she said, Dad, it hit me that my bosses have kids my age. They probably know more than I do. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Why am I telling you this? Here's the confidence you can have this week. If Jesus Christ sits on the throne on the right hand of the Father, some of you have bad bosses. Some of you don't like your bosses. As a Christian, you got to understand there is no authority in heaven or on earth that's been placed where it is unless the sovereign of hand of God allowed it to happen for as long as he wants to allow it to happen with the authority that he wants to give that hand. It may not be that you have a bad boss as much as God wants to sanctify you with that bad boss. God wants to use that authority in your life. It could be a spouse, it could be a child, it could be a school teacher, it could be a parent, whatever it is. God does not allow any authority in our lives where he's not working in that authority in our life. And it's never about the authority. It's always about our response to Jesus as our ultimate authority. You see, if you, if you don't like authority, a lot, of, a lot of us don't like authority. If you don't like authority, you don't like the word submission, you're going to have a hard time being a Christian. Because the entire Christian life is about submitting to an ultimate authority. What if I don't like what the authority wants? Who cares? None of your business. <laughs> when you create a world, you get to be in charge. And I told Lydia, I said, Lydia, here's what you need to do for three years. After three years, you can do whatever you want, except come live back at home. <laughs> for three years, your job, your only job, is to make your bosses as successful as you can and to work as hard as you can, and that's the way God's going to glorify himself through you. Don't try to evangelize the office this week. No one cares what a 23-year-old thinks, her first year in the accounting firm, about Jesus Christ and the afterlife. You work as hard as you can, and you try to make your bosses succeed, and you trust God and the sovereignty of God in that process, and you watch and see what he does. She called me last week. I don't know how she called me. It was after 11 o'clock. She was after work. She goes, Dad, I went to church this past Sunday. And one of my bosses was at the church I went to, and I just joined that church. I said, aren't you glad you didn't talk bad about that boss? Because now he's at your church. <laughs> that person may be a Christian, may not be. One day you may get to share with them your testimony. Guys, we're always working toward an opportunity to give someone the reason and the fence for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Amen? So let's not blow it this week with our witness. Know that we are little Jesuses, that he's going to spread out all over the city of Austin. And wherever he spreads you to, that's exactly where he wants a Jesus representation in that day, in that moment. Amen? Let me pray. Lord, I'm so grateful that this text is so practical. I'm so grateful that it cares about Tuesday. It cares about bosses. It cares about employees. It cares about what it means to trust you. Even when we're having to work under someone that we don't like or we don't agree with, even if they're non-Christian, Father, how much more important it is to be a witness as we work under non-Christians because we want to have an opportunity to share the reason for our hope. Lord, I'm grateful that you've taken my daughter and put her in a big bad city called Dallas and you put them under bosses in a corporate world and I'm glad that she has to struggle through that and I know that you're just as in control of her life right now as you've ever been, whether she's under my security, but she's always under your security. I pray for anybody in this room today that hasn't seen fit yet 
to place their faith and trust in Christ, that today would be the day of salvation and they would trust the king, the king who still reigns and the king that's going to win this battle with their heart. So they might as well go and submit to him now because he is undefeated. It's in the power of that king, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and enter this week. Amen.
God, we worship you this morning because you and you alone are holy and set apart. There's no one that's like you, no one that deserves our worship the way that you do. God, as you send us out of this place, I pray that you would send us on mission, on purpose, that you would give us your eyes to see and your ears to hear. A world around us that's, that's broken, that's hurting, help us to be bold in communicating our faith and help us to always be prepared to give an answer when someone asks the reason for the hope that we have. I thank you for being our hope. Thank you for allowing us to shine a light into a dark world. God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, friends, two quick things here at the end. Men, check it out. Got your attention. Guys, see you Tuesday night at Warrior Night. I'm serious. Be there. Um, and then the second thing is this. The parking lot is slammed. That's a great thing. We're excited about it. Be patient. Patience is the fruit of the Spirit. Go practice it. We love you guys. We'll see you next week.